Amen. Thank you, Michael. You may be seated. God is good. Amen. 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 We are finishing up our four-week look at the book of Ruth today, and I hope you have, have been blessed by this series. It's been a blessing for me to preach through the book of Ruth. I've never done that before. I've never preached through this book. And so it's been a blessing uh, for me to rediscover the story. And we've talked through the series about those times in our lives where we hated where we were more than we loved our God, right? More than we loved being faithful to Jesus. Those times when our discomfort led us to make some decisions that ended up hurting us or others in the process, right? And we've talked about how walking humbly in faith leads us exactly where God wants us to be. That was week two. And we were called to walk humbly and listen to the Lord. And then last week we talked about not letting your past keep you from your present or the future the Lord has for, for you. Not letting your past keep you from the present or the future the Lord has for you. We're going to finish up today by looking at the fourth chapter. So if you have your Bible, you have your phone, we can go there now. Ruth chapter 4, we'll get there in a moment if you go ahead and, and turn there. Um, on Mother's Day, uh, we were sitting in our backyard just kind of hanging out. The chos were there, and, and uh, we were just shooting the breeze, just hanging out on Mother's Day around our fire pit, just, just hanging out and just, just talking. And then out of the blue, Leem casually said, you know what? I, I may have bought a bunch of Bitcoin back when, when Bitcoin was like $10, uh, but I'm not sure. <laughs> this hush just fell over the crowd at our house. Uh, I don't know how much you know about Bitcoin, but if Lean had bought the amount of Bitcoin she thinks she bought in the year 2010, well, this will be my last Sunday here. Uh, <laughs> next Sunday I'll be preaching on some Caribbean island if I'm preaching at all. Um, but there is a problem. There is a problem. See, she thinks she did, but she cannot remember if she actually bought the Bitcoin. And if she did, she has no clue where it's sitting right now. So she is searching all of her emails to find some proof that she bought it, and if she did buy it, where it's sitting right now. So she's looking. And so if I'm here next week, you'll have your answer. <laughs> but who knows if it's out there. But the fact that I'm a Latham tells me it's not out there. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Uh, my my great-great-grandfather... Uh, was approached by a man one day asking him if he would like to invest in this new company. And my great-great-grandfather declined. The man was Asa Candler. The company was Coca-Cola. And then just this past week, my father thought it wise to share about the time that he was asked to speak at a company meeting. And while he was there, he was asked if he would like to buy stock in this company. And my father declined. This was the 1980s. And the company was Apple. We Lathams are not known for our financial savviness. So if we have Bitcoin, it's only because of lean. All right? But if we do not have Bitcoin, it's because now she's a Latham and she's been corrupted. But I cannot help this past week playing a game of what if, right? What if my great-great-grandfather had said yes to Asa Candler? What would that have meant to the Latham family? What if my father had said yes to buying Apple stock? What if? There is no telling how the opposite decisions would have affected my life. Those were two very big decisions. Of course, in the moment, right, they didn't look that big. They didn't look that big of a deal. I mean, there are thousands of companies every year looking for investors, and many of those companies will fail like the soda company that my great-grandfather did invest in. Some cherry cola company that, did, that went belly up pretty quick. But in the moment, you have no idea if the company's going to become big or not. It's only hindsight that shows me just how horrible Lathams are at picking winners. But that's the thing with decisions. We never know how they're going to play out. We can make an educated decision, but even then, we cannot say with 100% certainty how things are going to play out. Every decision we make creates ripples. 
those ripples, they may be small or they may be uh, significant, like a tidal wave. And in all honesty, we have no idea what the ripples are going to be. Right? A late night run to the store for some ice cream might just be that, right? A, a late night run where you go to the store, you, you get your ice cream, you get home, you sit down, you watch a movie, and you eat your ice cream. Or that late night run to the store will end up in a pretty serious accident. Right? Both of those things are possible. You have no way of knowing which will happen when you leave the house. We never know how things are going to play out. The decisions we make today not only affect us, but they also determine the legacy that we'll leave behind. While I don't know how my great-great-grandfather buying Coca-Cola stock would have changed our family, I would have liked to find out, I do know that his faith in Jesus greatly influenced my family. While I don't know how my dad buying Apple stock would have changed my life, I do know that his love for Jesus has greatly influenced my life. While there might not be much in terms of inheritance when it comes to money, I actually have an inheritance that's worth much more. See, the faith of my parents and my ancestors, their legacy is greater than any riches. Their legacy is one of faithfulness. See, we are all going to leave a legacy. And that legacy will be defined by the choices we make today and tomorrow and the next day. While we cannot control the outcomes of those decisions, we can increase the chance of a positive outcome by making sure we are making nothing but God-honoring decisions. I grew up, and maybe you're the same way, I grew up hearing preachers ask, if you die tonight, do you know where you're going? Have anyone ever heard that? If you die tonight, do you know where, where you'll go? Right? I think, I think the question for us today is if you died tonight, what would be your legacy? What would be your legacy? How will you be remembered? What kind of impact have you had on your family? That's what I want to look at today. The legacy we leave behind. You never know what effect your life might have on someone else and even the world. And often the effects of our decisions play out long after we are dead and gone. And they impact people who aren't even born yet. If you remember from last week, Boaz is one of the guardian redeemers of his family. Right? And as a guardian and redeemer, uh, his job, among others, is to marry widows in the families and to reclaim lost family land. And so Ruth went to him in the middle of the night, remember, to ask him to redeem Elimelech's family by marrying her. And so Boaz replied that he would, but there was another guardian redeemer who was related more closely to her, and so he would have first dibs. And that brings us to chapter 4. Boaz is in town. He bumps into this other guardian redeemer. Look at it with me, starting in verse 1. It says, Boaz went to the town gate and took a seat there. Just then, the family redeemer he had mentioned came by. So Boaz called out to him, Come over and sit down, friend. I want to talk to you. So they sat down together. Then Boaz called ten leaders from the town and asked them to sit as witnesses. And Boaz said to the family redeemer, You know Naomi, who came back from Moab? She's selling the land that belonged to her relative Elimelech. I thought I should speak to you about it so that you can redeem it if you wish. If you want the land, then buy it here in the presence of these witnesses. But if you don't want it, let me know right away, because I'm, in, I'm next in line to redeem it after you. The man replied, all right, I'll redeem it. Now, because it's not super obvious, I want, I want you to know that, that Boaz is going about this in a particular way in order to get the particular thing that he wants, which is Ruth as his wife. See, but the thing is, Boaz knows the rules, right? The other man has first dibs. Now, I, I know all the ladies today are just swooning over how romantic it is to think of someone having dibs over you. Uh, but those were the rules of the day. And Boaz is going to play by the rules, but he's also got a plan. And so he goes to this other man and lets him know that, that Naomi, the, the widow, ha has all this land that she wants to sell. If the, if the man buys it, then that will redeem the family. 
Well, the man knows Naomi. And the man knows that Naomi has no living children. So he could buy the land and not have to worry about Naomi's kids ever coming after it. So it sounds like a good deal. So he agrees to it. And that's when Boaz plays his other hand in verse 5. Then Boaz told him, of course, your purchase of the land from Naomi also requires that you marry Ruth, the Moabite widow. That way she can have children who will carry on her husband's name and keep the land in the family. Then I can't redeem it, the family redeemer replied, because this might endanger my own estate. You redeem the land. I cannot do it. See, I love Boaz here. He gets the man to agree to redeem the land, and then Boaz says, now, of course... Your purchase of the land also requires you to marry Ruth and have children with her. So I, I love this. I would have loved to just been there that day, have Boaz say that, and look at the man and just go, you just got played, play it. Right? And that's what Boaz was doing. He just played this guy. He knew that as soon as he mentioned Ruth and the requirement to give her a son, that this man would just completely balk at the idea. See, this man was interested in the land for himself. He didn't want any son of Ruth taking it from him one day. He was only interested in his needs, which is the exact opposite of Boaz. See, both were guardian and redeemers, but Boaz actually loved sacrificially. This other man was just in it for himself. The legacies left by each man was determined by this moment. Boaz's self, selfless love. Boaz's sacrificial love would leave a legacy that we in this room today are, are being blessed by. So I want you to understand this, church. The legacy left by Boaz reaches into this room today thousands of years later. See, so skip ahead in the story. Look down at verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth into his home, and she became his wife. When he slept with her, the Lord enabled her to become pregnant, and she gave birth to a son. Then the women of the town said to Naomi, Praise the Lord who has now provided a redeemer for your family. May this child be famous in Israel. May he restore your youth and care for you in your old age. For he is the son of your daughter-in-law who loves you, has been, has been better to you than seven sons. Naomi took the baby and cuddled him to her breast. After she cared for him as uh, and she cared for him as, 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 as if he were her own. The neighbor women said, now at last Naomi has a son again. And they named him Obed. I'll stop there for a moment. Boaz agrees to redeem Ruth and Naomi. And he marries Ruth. Right? They consummate the relationship and Ruth bears a son. And they name him Obed. Now that in and of itself is a lot. Boaz has done the righteous thing. He has redeemed Naomi and Ruth. He has made it so Elimelech's land stays in the family. And if the story ended there, I think we all would be satisfied, right? Naomi is uprooted from her home and moved by her husband to the pagan land of Moab. There, he and, and, and their sons die. She, she's left all alone with her daughters-in-law with nothing to her name. She, she moves back to Judah to try to carve out some type of, of, of existence. But because the Lord is good and faithful, Ruth encounters Boaz, and Boaz ends up saving the day. That's a good story. It's a good romance story. It would make a great movie. Boaz marries uh, Ruth. They have a son, and they live happily ever, ever after. And as the credits roll, there's just an image of Naomi rocking her grandson, Obed. We would leave the theater satisfied, maybe a little teary-eyed, Right? And maybe for some in the story, this was the end. Or at least all the story they would know. According to Jewish tradition, Boaz actually died on his wedding night. If that's the case, he never knew his son. He never got to watch his legacy play out. Maybe Naomi got to watch Obed grow up, but maybe she, she died before he had any, uh, a family of his own. Ruth may have been around to see Obed get married and have a son of his own, uh, of his own, a son they called Jesse. But maybe Ruth was long gone before Jesse ever had a family. The point is we never get to fully see how our legacy plays out. Boaz agreed to redeem Ruth. Boaz could never imagine what that decision would mean for the world. Look at 
uh, verse 17. The neighbor women said, Now at last Naomi has a son again, and they named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse and the grandfather of David. Oh, but church, Boaz's legacy doesn't end there. Boaz was the father of Obed. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David. David was the father of Nathan. Nathan was the father of Manatha. Manatha was the father of Minna. Minna was the father of Malia. Malia was the father of Eliakim. Eliakim was the father of Jonam. Jonam was the father of Joseph. Joseph was the father of Judah. Judah was the father of Simeon. Simeon was the father of Levi. Levi, Levi was the father of Mathat. Mathat was the father of Joram. Joram was the father of Eliezer. Eliezer was the father of Joshua. Joshua was the father of Ur. Ur was the father of Elmadam. Elmadam was the father of Kosam. Kosam was the father of Addy. I'm going somewhere with this. Addy was the father of Melki. Melki was the father of Neri. Neri was the father of Sheathil. Sheathil was the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the father of Resa. Resa was the father of Joan. Joan was the father of Jodah. Jodah was the father of Joash. Joash was the father of Simeon. Simeon was the father of Matthias. Matthias was the father of Math. Math was the father of Nagai. Nagai was the father of uh, Esli. Esli was the father of Nahum. Nahum was the father of Amos. Amos was the father of uh, Mattathias. Mattathias was the father of Joseph. Joseph was the father of Janai. Janai was the father of Melchi. Melchi was the father of Levi. Le was, Levi was the father of Madhat. Madhat was the father of Eli. And Eli was the father of Joseph. And here is the payoff. Joseph was the father of Jesus Christ. Now, I know that was a lot of names. And there will be a quiz. <laughs> but I read all those to make a point. Boaz couldn't have known the moment he married Ruth that he would become, wait for it, the great, 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 Boaz could never imagine that he would be Jesus' 43rd great-grandfather. So often when we think about what we will leave behind, we think what we're going to leave behind for our children. Maybe our grandchildren. But most people don't ever think about what they're going to leave behind for their great-grandchildren. And I'm pretty sure that no one in this room has ever thought about what they're going to leave behind for their 43rd great-grandchild. Shouldn't we? I mean, I'm, that's a serious question. Because God has already begun thinking about your 43rd great grandchild. God already has plans for your 43rd great grandchild. I want to make sure you're tracking with me here. God's call on Ruth's life and God's call on Boaz's life was part of God's plan to come to earth as Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. Ruth's faithfulness and Boaz's faithfulness allowed God's plan to play out. But they could have said no. We need to understand this. I think sometimes we read the Bible and we forget these are real people, right? These are real people, people who face many of the same temptations that we face, maybe in different ways, but they too face temptation, right? The temptation to look out for, for ourselves, that existed then as well. The temptation to do whatever we want to do, that existed then as well. See, Ruth did not have to be faithful. Boaz did not have to be faithful. Church, you do not have to be faithful. That is your choice. However, imagine if Boaz had chosen to be selfish. Imagine if Boaz had been like the other guardian and redeemer and just looked out for himself. Right? What would have happened then? If Ruth had not chosen to be faithful to Naomi, if Boaz had not chosen to, be, to redeem Ruth, they had no idea all the ways God would use their faithfulness. I mean, maybe they saw some of the results. They didn't see all of them. But because of the faithfulness of Ruth and Boaz, I'm standing here today. And that's not hyperbole. Out of 
out of the faithfulness of Ruth, our Savior, Jesus Christ, was born. And he saved me from my sins. And I'm able to stand before you every Sunday and preach the good news of Jesus Christ. I know Boaz never thought of me when he chose to redeem Ruth. But I know that my God did. My God thought of me in that moment. My God thought of you. Because Boaz put others before himself, we have been blessed. And that's the call of all of our lives as well. So this morning, I want to give you five essentials to leaving a legacy that will honor God and bless those who come after you. Just really quickly, five essentials. So if you have your phone, you open up your notes app on your phone and just jot these down. If you have a pen and a piece of paper, you can jot it down there. But five essentials. The first one is this. Fear the Lord and obey Him. Fear the Lord and obey Him. Psalm 112, 1 and 2 says, Praise the Lord. How joyful are those who fear the Lord and delight in obeying His commands. Their children will be successful everywhere. An entire generation of godly people will be blessed. Parents, I hope you read that. I hope you tattoo it to your eyeballs. How joyful are those who fear the Lord and delight in obeying His commands. Why? Because their children will be successful everywhere. An entire generation of godly people will be blessed. See, your legacy, church, begins in your heart. Who is the Lord of your heart? Is it you or is it God? Do you love the things of this world more than the creator of this world? Your godly legacy is born out of your relationship with your God. So how's your heart? Does he govern every aspect of your life? Is he actually Lord of all? See, too many Christians, uh, they, they like to compartmentalize their lives, right? Jesus is Lord of this and this, but I'm Lord of that. Folks, if we want to leave behind a true godly legacy, Jesus must be Lord of it all. Lord over all of our decisions. Let me say that again. Lord over every decision. Every decision. God loves the details. Every decision. So again, how's your heart? Who's the Lord of your life? And then number two, we must recognize the needs of the world and respond with compassion and action. We must recognize the needs of the world and respond with compassion and action. Matthew 9, 36 says, When he, Jesus, saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. The legacy we are called to leave behind can never be left behind by apathetic Christians. See, too many Christians see how badly the world needs Jesus and yet do absolutely nothing to introduce people to Jesus. Too many Christians sit on the front porch of church wagging their finger at all those heathens out there but never actually engage with those so-called heathens in a way that shows them just how much Jesus loves them. Jesus didn't just see the confused and the helpless. Jesus had compassion for the confused and the helpless, and Jesus acted on behalf of the confused and the helpless. That compassion compelled him to serve them to love them, to care for them, to, to pray for them. The church does not lack for people who see the problems, but the church does lack for people who will work to fix the problems. My father had a policy in the churches he pastored. He told his staff, don't bring me a problem. Bring me a solution. Church, we have to stop just yelling about the problems in our world. We have to get involved. And posting something on Facebook is not getting involved. We have to stop caring about being mocked and ridiculed. We have to stop caring about fitting in. Jamie Buckingham, an Australian pastor, once said, and I love this quote, the problem with Christians today is that no one wants to kill them anymore. <laughs> Let it sink in. The problem with Christians today is that no one wants to kill them anymore. Now, obviously, that is not 
the case in places like India and China that's happening there, but in our culture, the Western culture, nobody wants to kill us. In order to leave behind a godly legacy, you're going to have to take a stand. It's not enough to just recognize the problems in our community. It's not enough just to recognize the problems that our culture is facing. The church of Jesus Christ must become the church of Jesus Christ. A church that is, that is passionate about showing compassion. So if you want to leave behind a godly legacy, don't just see the hurting and the lost. Have compassion on and find a way to minister to them like we do at Table on Death. So it's about putting the needs of others before yourself. Just like Boaz did. Just like Ruth did. The third essential. Pray that God will use you to accomplish his purpose. Pray that God will use you to accomplish his purpose. One of the most famous prayers in the Bible is known as the prayer of Jabez. It's 1 Chronicles 4.10. It says, he was the one who prayed to the God of Israel. Oh, that you would bless me and expand my territory. Please be with me in all that I do and keep me from all trouble and pain. And God granted him his request. Jabez's prayer was, was simple and yet it was incredibly profound. Right? He prayed to be, to be blessed, but he, but he also prayed for God to expand his territory. This was not only a prayer for success, but it was a, a prayer for God to, to enlarge his influence. But he kept praying. He said, bless me, Lord. Help me be a blessing. And then, please be with me in all that I do and keep me from all trouble and pain. Do you remember me saying that Jesus must be the Lord of every decision we make? This is what I was talking about. A prayer for protection from all trouble and pain is a prayer for Jesus to guide your steps. It's the prayer of a fully surrendered heart. Lord, guide my steps. Help me make good decisions. Let me not take one unholy step so that your will, not mine, but your will is accomplished. Accomplished for you and for your 43rd great Number four, be a good steward of the gifts and abilities God has given you. Be a good steward of the gifts and abilities God has given you. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 14 says, There is one body, but it has many parts. But all as many parts make up one body. It is the same with Christ. We were all baptized by one Holy Spirit, and so we are formed into one body. It didn't matter whether we were Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free people. We were all given the same spirit to drink. So the body is not made of just one part. It has many parts. We each have been given gifts and abilities that God wants to use to love and serve this world. We will never leave the legacy God wants us to leave if we are not using all of our gifts and service to him. Church, you have gifts and abilities. Gifts and abilities that were given to you by your creator. He had very good reason to give you that gift or that ability that you have. And so let me ask you, what are the gifts that he's given you? What is the ability that he's given you? Maybe the, the gift of teaching, maybe it's the gift of care, maybe it's the gift of service or administration. I don't know. Maybe it's the gift of singing, playing an instrument. But what are the gifts and abilities he's given you? Whatever it is, God has given you gifts and abilities, and when you use them to bring him glory, you will leave behind the legacy God wants you to leave behind. And then number five, ask God to give your children a sense of purpose, direction, and mission. Ask God to give your children a sense of purpose, direction, and mission. If you've missed any of those five, come, come see me after worship and I'll fill it in for you. Ask God to give your children a sense of purpose, direction, and mission. Now, if you don't have children, don't tune this one out because we're all called to pray for the next generation. Even if you don't have anyone in the next generation. We all need to be praying daily for the Holy Spirit to move in the lives of our children. See, I know one of the reasons that I'm a, I'm a preacher today is because my grandmother 
Rowena Berry. Her first name was Lillian. Middle name was Rowena. She chose to go by Rowena. I never understood it. But Rowena Berry prayed every single day for me. I know my parents prayed every day for me. I know others prayed every day for me. My grandmother Baird never got to fully enjoy her grandson becoming a preacher because she suffered from dementia at the end of her life. But I can tell you today, I am the legacy of Rowena Baird. I am the legacy of Tom and Rowena Baird. I am the legacy of Ray and Leela Latham. I am the legacy of Warren and Jane Latham. I am the legacy and the le uh, of, of hundreds more. And to God be all the glory. See, my kids didn't know my grandparents, but my kids are their legacy. And the legacy of my grandparents and the legacy of my parents will continue to bless generations to come through my faithfulness and my desire to leave behind a godly legacy. You see, all five of these essentials have one thing in common, and that's selflessness. A godly legacy is born out of selflessness. What legacy are you going to leave? Have you even thought about it? Have you ever thought about what's the legacy I'm leaving? Let me ask you this. What is the single most important legacy you want to leave for the next generation? Parents, what is the single most important legacy you want to leave for your children? Grandparents, what's the single most important legacy you want to leave for your grandkids? Those who don't have children, what is the single most important legacy that you want to leave for just the next generation? Not two or three things. That, that's too easy, church. Generalization is easy. I don't want generalization. I want you to define it today. Definition is what is needed in your life. What is the single most important legacy you want to leave for the next generation. Tommy, uh, uh, actually, Heather and Elijah, come here. Come here. Tommy doesn't feel well, so I'm going to let him just sit there. Y'all pass those out. watching online, I'll explain this in a, in a moment. You can do this where you are as well. Heather and Elijah are handing you a card, and on this card, you'll see the sentence starter, the single most important legacy I want to leave is, and then three blank lines. You'll actually see that twice on the card I gave you, and I'll explain that in a moment. But if you have a pen, take out a pen, you don't have a pen, um, we can get you a pen. There's some in the drawers back there. Let me just bring it back up here. Thank you all. Thank you all. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to fill this out in here today. If you have a pen, fill out. If you don't have a pen and, and we can't get you a pen or whatever, um, then just write it down on your phone. But I want you to fill this out. So take a moment, think about the, quest, the, the sentence, the single most important legacy I want to leave is blank. And I want you to write it down twice on this card. And I think Alan's working to get us some pins. So uh, one second, when he comes out, you can raise your hand and land you a pen. But I want you to fill this out. Raise your hand, Alan's got some pins for you. Thank you, sir. If you're watching online, uh, again, the sentence is the single most important legacy I want to leave is blank. I encourage you to you, uh, use your phone, take a note on your phone, fill out that, that sentence, finish that sentence. Uh, if you want to uh, put it in the comments and let us know what your legacy is that you want to leave behind, we'd love to know that as well. The single most important legacy I want to leave is blank. Fill that out on the top and the bottom. Once you have that filled in, you'll see a dotted line in the middle. If you want to invite
trying to tear along that dotted line as best you can. We are low tech here, so I couldn't do perforated paper. Uh, so uh, just do your best to tear that on that dotted line, tear it in half. So that you now have two copies. So write the legacy you want to leave and then tear it in half so you have two copies. One of those copies is for you to keep. It is your record of the decision you made here today. So don't take this lightly. You're going to take this home with you. And it's going to be your record. The other copy is for you to bring to the table up front, laid on the table, because we're going to pray over the legacies that you want to leave behind. We're going to pray over your responses. We're going to ask God to, to burn this decision in our hearts so that we can pursue this legacy with, with a singular purpose and focus in our lives. Right, Every decision we make from here on out should be in service to leaving the legacy to which God has called us. So go ahead and finish that up. Michael, I invite you to come back up. Maybe just strong for a little bit. But as you finish, I invite you to come, just lay it on the table here, and then we'll pray over it. I invite you to come now. Let's pray. Precious Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you are looking not only a, a day in advance, but 43 generations in advance. And you're wanting to use us to, to reach not only the people right around us that we can see and we can touch, but people we can't even see around us, but also uh, people who aren't, a, aren't even born yet. Who impress upon us today the importance of every decision we make being a God-honoring one. Because every decision that does not honor you uh, tears, tears uh, down uh, our legacy. Tears a bit of our legacy down and it makes it less than. And so, Lord, I thank you for the legacies you've laid on our hearts today. The desires that people wrote down on this little sheet of paper. Lord, I lift it up to you. Lord, I pray that these legacies will come true. <laughs> That the next generation will look back at us and say, I'm standing here because of the 
the people who were gathered in the gathering church on that day in 2022. My life has been changed because of their faithfulness. Lord, I pray that one day in the year 2222, someone in my line will look back and say, I'm thankful for my great, great, great whatever grandfather, Jared, and his faithfulness. As the Lord write these legacies on our hearts today, remind us of these legacies anytime we have to make a decision, no matter how small. Whether it's, do you, do you really spend another 20 minutes watching TV or do you get up and spend time with your kids? Lord, I hear you talking to me. I hear you talking to me. Lord, let us chase after the legacy you, you have for us with great abandon, with selflessness. I pray this all in the name of Jesus. 